Hey, you guys can have a seat. I have one more quick announcement I wanted to make. Celebration time. Jared Beebe, our children's pastor, went away over Memorial Weekend and ended up getting engaged. So I want to have Alexis Krejci and Jared stand, and we want to congratulate you guys. Congratulations <laughs> is in order. Hey, I want to talk about getting prepared this morning. Think about the things you love to do and how much time it takes to get prepared to do those things. If you're a hunter, you can understand this. It takes, well, you know, for us guys, we go out and we pre-scout where we're going to hunt, and then we we make sure that we have everything we need, and we get all this stuff together. My family was a big camping family, and I remember we'd go on extended camping trips, and my mom, for, for really weeks ahead, she had one room that she would set aside, and she just... During the weeks, you'd see this room fill up, and then just days prior, Mom knew that we had everything we needed for a couple-week camping trip with our family. It doesn't matter what you do. It takes a lot of preparation to do what you do really, really well. Some of you play sports, and you put a lot of time and energy into that, a lot of different things. And we're in this series called Amplify, and we're talking about the warfare, the spiritual warfare that we face from the evil one. I was thinking about that. It just makes sense that if we're facing a spiritual enemy, an adversary, Satan, the devil, and we're in a spiritual battle, that we should go to great lengths to be prepared. Right? just makes sense. I mentioned this last week. It's not a joke. This is not a game. The enemy has one mission. I want to remind you of that mission this morning. It says in John 10 that the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. And so we have an adversary, we have an enemy, and he only has that mission. We mentioned last week that in and of ourselves we can't stand against the opposition. We have no chance in our flesh. This is a spiritual battle that's to be fought fought with spiritual weapons. The encouraging news last week that we looked at was that in Christ, in a relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ, we can have victory over any and all opposition. But the fact of the matter is the responsibility part of this lies with each individual believer. You can't pawn this off on your pastor or the elders, the leadership. This is really between you and God. What Paul does in this letter is he makes it very personal, very individual. He's talking to the body as a whole. He wants the body to be healthy. He wants the body to be a light. He wants the body to experience victory. What he does in this particular passage, he looks at the individual believers and he calls us to put on the armor of God, to stand. I can't do that for you. There's times as a pastor, believe me, there are times as a pastor as you wish you could just go out and just help people do what they're called to do because you know it would be better for them. One of the painful aspects of being a pastor is watching people... um, good friends sometimes, sometimes just just acquaintances, but watch people make really bad decisions that go completely contrary to what the Word of God says. I shared with you guys that what I wanted to do is I wanted to spend a couple weeks, us together, looking at what's the armor of God, because it's through putting on the armor of God that we are able to stand against the schemes of the devil. If you don't put on the armor of God, you cannot, you will not, you do not have the ability in and of yourself to stand against the devil's schemes. He's just too tricky. He's too crafty. He's too deceptive. And so we're going to walk through this today. We're going to look at a few of these. And um, here's what I'd like to do, just to kind of get us in a little bit of a mindset that we're at battle. We're going to do a little... uh, 
kind of a a little drums thing. Stand up. I'm going to have you read the passage with me today um, that we're looking at. Because this is war that we are facing. I want you to take it seriously. So um, go ahead, OJ. I'm going to do a little... So imagine we're headed into battle because you are, each one of you. Your adversary has got his eyes on you, and all he wants to do is take you out. He doesn't want you to walk in victory. He doesn't want you to live a victorious life with Christ because then you would be this incredible testimony and be telling other people. And this is kind of where the rubber meets the road for each of you. The scriptures say, put on the armor of God. And we're going to look at it. We're going to read it. So let's say this together, these few passages together. Here we go. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day comes, you will be able to stand your ground And after you have done everything to stand, you can be seated. Thank you, OJ. I want to pray for us. God, uh, in this time where we just open up your word and we look at truth and you tell us to put on armor, I pray that you would shed some light in each and every heart here and how how they can do what it is that you're asking them to do, what you're asking me to do, what you're asking us to do, so that we can be protected prepared and experience victory that you've provided for us. God, I pray your Holy Spirit would give us insight. And if anyone's here this morning who doesn't know you or has strayed from you, I pray that you just grab their heart and turn them towards you. And so use this time we have in your word, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As we looked at this passage last week, there were four truths that we drew from that that I just want to remind us of because it's really critical as we go into this. One was this, that we're draw, draw upon the power of God. When he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, he's saying, be empowered. Believers, be empowered. So draw upon the power of God. Second thing from these passages we saw is put on the armor of God. And we're going to spend these next couple of weeks, what does that look like? Third thing I want to remind you is that you recognize your battle is, it's, uh, it's with the enemy of God. That's who our battle is with. Uh, And then finally, stand in victory with God. We can, but only through God. Now, the reason I want to encourage us to take preparation and get this armor on is here's what you find. You read this passage and you just look at what it's saying. It's saying, properly prepare and you'll reduce devastation. In other words, if you don't prepare, if you don't get the armor on, you're going to get devastated. Your life's going to be a train wreck. You're not going to have joy. You're not going to have peace. You're not going to have contentment. You're going to live in despair, live in doubt, live in fear, and live in defeat. So um, you properly prepare. You're going to reduce devastation. The reason, uh, I, would say, I, I would say this. I'd say biblically, we could remove devastation if we walked in complete alignment with the Spirit of God. But because we're in process, let me say this, um, let's, let's move towards reducing devastation. He has removed it. We need to learn how to walk in so that we can reduce it, minimize it. And the other part of properly being prepared is we increase celebration. What God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, by having him go to a cross and pay for our sin is he has provided a place for us to walk in victory and not in defeat. That is a place of celebration, not in mourning. But we must, our part is to be properly prepared. So you're either going to prepare for the battle or you're going to get beat, right? You're going to prepare for the war or you're going to get whooped. Prepare for the clash or you're going to get conquered. And I don't care how you say it, how you slice it, how you dice it. 
our part as followers of Jesus Christ, God is saying through Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writing these words, put on the armor of God so you can stand. So how do we prepare? First of all, this scripture, this next verse says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So there's two things we're going to look at, two parts of armor, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. We have up here, this this would have been a Roman soldier. This would have been similar to what they would have looked like when Paul's writing this. And they would have been everywhere. Rome was the authority of the day. They were in charge. I remember when we went to uh, Ecuador and Peru, we'd go to some of these places, and uh, it was clear who was in charge there. They'd they'd be dressed in camo, but they'd have their AKs with them, and they'd be standing on every street corner. In Rome, when Paul's writing this, or in, in Ephesus, when he's writing this, it would have not been uncommon to see a Roman soldier. What Paul's doing is he's taking the imagery that they would have been very familiar with, uh, of the Roman soldier, and he's grabbing p- pieces of that armor, and then he's making a spiritual application. So they would have had this belt. The first thing I want to look at is we're gonna, it's, it's called the, the belt of, he's saying, uh, take this belt that the Roman soldier would have wore, and you do this. He says, stand firm then with the belt of truth. So think about this. What he's really, what the image seems to be, surround yourself, surround yourself with truth. This makes a lot of sense when you think of who your enemy is. You surround yourself with truth because your enemy's what? What is he? He's a liar. So think about that. If your enemy's a liar, then you better be surrounded with truth. Just let that sink in for a second because it's pretty deep. It's deeper than we're going to grasp here on a quick uh, little journey through this passage. You begin to think that the father of lies is out there and it's a spiritual battle, and all the things that comes at us, well, we better, have, we better be buckled up. We better be surrounded with truth, because if we're not, we can't discern what is of the devil and what is not. What's a lie? He is the great deceiver. He is the persistent pretender and the master masquerader. A couple years ago, I did a sermon series about this called Smoke and Mirrors, and each sermon I did, I, I basically duped Almost everybody in the congregation week after week with a little trick without even being a magician. Just doing simple little things. And, and if I can do it in flesh and blood, imagine how tricky Satan is in the spirit world at creating deception and illusion. Now, one of the things I did was I, I got a baking chocolate, dark baking chocolate, and special dark bar. And I had these pieces on a tray and you could smell them, and they smelled identical. I mean, really, you couldn't tell the difference. And you could look at them, and they both had a very good appeal to them. Well, we passed them out, and everybody was excited about getting chocolate, and they began to gnaw on them, and some were just chewing it and loving it, and others were like spitting it out because it was so awful. Well, Satan's like that. He presents something to us that has an appeal. It's like, man. That just looks good. It looks like it'll satisfy. Man, that looks like there's life there. And he's always holding forth something as if it's going to provide some sense of life. And in the end, it's just death and it's bitter and it's destructive. But that's our enemy. He is the liar, the father of lies. It says this in John 8, Jesus speaking to a crowd who didn't believe in him. He says, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He, this is talking about Satan here. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's our enemy. So be surrounded with truth. Think about this. Anybody here enjoy just being lied to? (laughs) It's like, man, I'm just so glad you lied to me. No, we hate that. We don't, we don't like that. It's like we hate being lied to. There's, there's not a couple in here in a marriage relationship that said, man, I just really enjoy when my spouse deceived me and didn't tell me the truth. No, we know that that creates disunity in any relationship. I promise you, there's not a parent here who believes that their, their son or their daughter told them they were going to be somewhere and found out that they were somewhere else and they were lied to. We don't like that. 
We don't like it in any relationship. It just, it just makes sense. We don't like it. It's not healthy. It's not good. And yet we face an enemy who is absolutely the father of lies. He eats, sleeps, and craves deception. So by golly, we better be buckled up and surrounded with truth or we will be duped. I was joking with a friend of mine this morning. I said, I wish I had like this big giant trophy. Because it, it gives Satan like a trophy. You are the winner. You're the father of lies. You are like the best liar out there. And church family, it's a spirit battle in the spirit world. And he is constantly, constantly, constantly seeking to deceive you. I was thinking about this idea of being surrounded. Surround yourself with truth. And I was thinking about that, and I got this image. It came to me, and it reminded me of why it's so important to be surrounded by truth. Probably about 15, 18 years ago, I went with a group of guys on a camping trip. We went to the Ocoee River, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, it was in the Olympics a couple years ago. They did whitewater rafting there, but it's kind of a, it's a controlled stream by a dam. They do a release, they sound a siren, and then the water comes up and... It's, it's white water, and people go down there and white water raft and so forth. I went up there with a group of guys to trout fish. We got our out-of-state license, and uh, we were trout fishing, fly fishing. Well, a couple of us got this idea. Let's go above the dam, because surely nobody's ever been, like, above the dam. Because <laughs> it was like, I mean, it was a couple miles we had to hike. And we got above the dam. Well, above the dam, the water was real still. There were pockets that were deep. I wandered out into this stream uh, with my hip boots on, and I get out there probably 20, 30 feet out into this, and it's fairly still water, and I'm just fly fishing, and I look over, and there's a nice copperhead. It's like, oh, my gosh, I hate snakes. I mean, there's not much worse for me than snakes. But I, I looked over, and there's another one. Like, oh, my goodness. I look just a few feet away as a water moccasin. And in about three or four minutes after I was positioned, I gazed around, and I had snakes all around me. And I was, I, I was like, I was horrified. I, I was standing out far enough that I was thinking, how am I going to get back on the bank and get back home? Right? That's what I wanted to do. Alive. And I was thinking about that image, and I was thinking, you know, that's, that's kind of us in our journey. Every one of us, man, there are snakes and there are vipers, and he has them positioned everywhere. And you can't really take a step out there without them being there. What I'm trying to do is heighten our sensitivity to how much evil is around us in the spirit world and how much Satan desires to take you out. I said a lot of prayers in those few moments, headed back to the shoreline and watching those things, you know. And I was so glad to get back. But I, I thought of that image, and I really think the reason that Paul is using this image of being surrounded with truth is because we are surrounded by evil. It's interesting, when you contrast that with who God is, everything about God is true. That we know that God is truth, and Jesus is truth, and the Spirit is truth, His Word is truth. It says this in John 1, that the word, speaking of Jesus Christ himself here, Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the epitome of truth. John 1.17, just a few verses later in the book of John. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The absolute opposite of the liar. Jesus himself has his disciples with him, and they're troubled. He's telling them he's not going to be with them much longer. And he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's truth. And those of us who profess faith in him, it's how we worship him. Walking in obedience and faithfulness to the truth. He says this in John 4. He was speaking to a, a woman at the well there who had not walked in truth. And uh, in this conversation, she's coming to believe that he's the Messiah. And he says this, 
A time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth. So he's calling us to walk in obedience to God. He was in a conversation with Pilate. Here's another verse I want to highlight. Pilate says, you're a king then, says Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Satan on one side, absolute father of lies and deceiver and deceptive. And over here we have God, Jesus, we have spirit, we have his word, all of it's true. And we looked at this a couple weeks ago during Memorial Day weekend. I did a thing about freedom and we looked at this passage about how the truth sets us free. Listen as I read this from John 8, he says, to the, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they said, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been a slave to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replies, I verily, I, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. So hold to the truth. The truth will set you free. It all points to who God is. The question is, will we walk in truth? Will we obey truth? Will we follow God and live for God? St. Augustine says this, the truth's like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose, it'll defend itself. There may be some of you right now that are living a lie, not being honest with a mate or a friend or someone else, and just know that that's not of God. It's not of God. Last week I shared with you, I became aware of a situation where you know, an um, acquaintance of mine has professed to be in an affair. They're living a double life, a lie. Someone said this, truth's like surgery. It hurts, but it cures. Lies like a painkiller. It gives instant relief, but then it has side effects forever. Someone else wrote this, that the only people mad at you for speaking the truth are those living in a lie. I encourage us around here. I really believe this is such a part of following Jesus. And two of the most needed elements in the life of the church is one, to obey truth, and the other is to speak the truth in love to one another so that we can spur one another on to love and good deeds in Christ. So properly preparing, reducing devastation, increasing celebration has to do with surrounding yourself with truth. So think about that. Are you in the Word on a regular basis? Are you around community that's pointing you to the truth, people who speak the truth in love to you? And then the, the, the second part, I want to ask the band if they'll come up. Uh, real quick, I just want to run through the second part. He says, not only stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, but with the breastplate of righteousness in place. I want to go back to our Roman soldier guy here. Um, it, what area is the breastplate of righteousness in this, in this from the Roman soldier? What, what area does the breastplate protect somebody? Okay, it takes care of the heart, which we would say that's kind of like a vital area, right? So it's protecting the vital area. So think about the imagery of what Paul's doing here. He's talking to believers, and he's going, okay, devil's out there. He's lying. He's scheming. So the first thing you better do is be, be surrounded with truth. You better know your, right? You know what's true and what's, what's a lie. The second thing, it's interesting, it's the second thing he goes after is this breastplate to protect your heart. And what's really fascinating to me is how you protect your heart. Righteousness. That seems like a strange way to protect someone's heart. Righteousness. But let that sink in for just a moment. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. The scriptures tell us we're to love the Lord our God with our mind, with our heart, with our soul, with our strength. This breastplate of righteousness protects us. Satan wants to harm you. He wants to maim your heart. He wants to wound you. He wants to create and inflict serious damage upon 
your heart. Well, what I want to do is I'd like to give you like a 30,000 look view of righteousness in about three minutes if I could. Because I think this will be helpful. And why this breastplate of righteousness is so critical for you and for me to walk in victory. 30,000 foot view in three minutes. Think about this. We said that God and Jesus and Holy Spirit are all right, uh, perfect, right? No error. So righteous is, it's that. It's like there's, he's just, he's holy, he's perfect. He's without any imperfection. So God is that. And you can tell when you read the scriptures and the way he deals with people, the poor people, and how he works and uh, deals with disobedient people. Just the way God does everything, he's perfect. So you contrast that with humanity, where it says in Romans 3 that there's none righteous, no, not one. None. Not any aspect of us. In fact, he goes on to say that all sin and fall short of the glory of God, that every, every one of us is separated because of our imperfection. So you contrast the righteousness of God with the unrighteousness of humanity. And this is where God's love comes in. God says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ, who's going to come live a perfect life. And then he's going to go to a cross. And he's going to take all your unrighteousness upon himself and pay for it in full. And God's wrath towards our sin is going to be satisfied because of that payment. And then... This is the kicker. God's going to go, and then I will see you as righteous. You go, man, that's not even possible. I'm still a bozo. I still, I still am sometimes sharp with my bride, where I don't discipline my kids in relation to what they deserve. There's so many things, God. How can you see me as clean? And he says, because I'm looking at you through the shed blood of my son who paid in full for you so that you can be declared righteous. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 So, so think about this. Contrast this with what Satan says about you. He, I promise you. I promise you. He's kicking dirt in your face all the time trying to get you to believe that you're, you don't have value or that you don't have worth or that you're not significant or that you're a loser or that you've screwed up so bad that God could never possibly do great things through you. He, Satan spends his time trying to get us to believe something that's an absolute lie. And what Paul's doing is going, no, believers, put on the righteousness of who you are in God. It'll protect you from Satan's foolishness. And so, believers, I want you to understand this today, that you are righteous. Not because of works that you have done, but because of his great love demonstrated in what Jesus did for you. You're seen as righteous, so put on that breastplate and protect your heart this morning. The scriptures say this in Romans, and I want to read this because you can't say it any better than Paul wrote it here. There is no one, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight, sight by works of the law. You can't be good enough. Rather, through the law, we just become conscious of our sin. It's like the more we try to do good and obey, the more we realize we're a screw up. But now... Apart from the law, righteousness of God has been made known. It has been revealed to which the law and the prophets speak about. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew, Gentile, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came from Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. He goes on to say this, that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received simple, by simple faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished and now they're being dealt with in his son. And he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be the just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So trust him. And he's going to see you as righteous because his son has taken upon himself all your stuff. 33 times in the book of Romans, Paul mentions the word righteousness. 
And God has the armor of righteousness for us if we will just embrace it. Just protect your heart with his righteousness, what God says about you. Satan wants you to believe you're a sinner, and God says, no, you're a saint. He wants to, Satan wants you to believe that you're damaged goods and unusable, and God's gone, no way. My son paid the ultimate price. You're my child. I want you to listen to me. If God were speaking to you today, and I don't want to pretend I know the very words of God, but I think he'd say something like this. When Satan says that you're a nobody, God's saying, no, 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 no. Protect your heart with my righteousness. I see you as a saint. I see you as a son or a daughter. I paid for your sin in full through the blood of my own son. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're a slave to righteousness. I put my Holy Spirit in you. You're not a loser. You're my child, and I've adopted you as my very own. I have forgiven your sins as far as the east is from the west. You've been cleansed from them. I see you as washed and whiter than snow. I see you as clean, washed, and perfect, completely forgiven, accepted, and loved. He would say, please don't believe the father of lies. I've given you my righteousness to protect your heart. It's who you are. It's who I've made you. It's why I sent my son. Don't believe the liar. Put truth on. Put that breastplate on who you are in him. I'll tell you, it'll carry you. It'll carry you through the storms. He would say, let me remind you that I chose you before the foundation of the world. You were predestined to be adopted as one of my kids. And you've been redeemed through the precious blood of my son. You've been forgiven of everything you've done, past, present, or even future. All because of my grace. You've been sealed by my Holy Spirit of promise. I gave him to you as a deposit, guaranteeing your inheritance and your eternal destiny to be in my presence. You have an eternal home with me. And all this has been available to you through my righteousness, my son. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so we could be the righteousness of God in him. Put that armor on. Put on the whole armor. So far we talked about the belt of truth. I cannot encourage you enough to be in the word. Every day be in the word. See what it has to say. Let it speak to your heart. And let that righteousness of who you are in Christ not who you are in your flesh and who you were before you met God, but who you are in Christ. Man, just enjoy that. I'm going to share with you how this works because God allows me opportunity through my weeks to try this stuff that I share with you every week. And some of you know my bride went in Wednesday uh, to a doctor's office because she had a lot of abdominal pain and back pain and blood in her urine and a bunch of other stuff. Well, we go in the emergency room because the doctor said, I can't help you go to the emergency room. And she's still there. I was up there, spent the night with her this, tonight, last night. And uh, so far, no headway. A lot of antibiotics and a lot of stuff. But she has what uh, many of you are familiar with, diverticulitis. She has that, at least that. Well, they were doing a scan of her abdomen. They found a spot, uh, just happened to find a spot on her lungs. They said, we don't like it. We can't deal with that right now. We're going to deal with this. After we get out of that, then we'll deal with that. And they said there's a chance it's benign, but we got to check it out. And I got to tell you, dad, husband, six kids, uh, and life just coming at you. I'll tell you what keeps joy in your step, contentment in your soul, and peace is guarding your heart with truth. 
stay in the word you know trust the Lord with all your heart don't lean on your understanding all your ways acknowledge him he'll make your paths straight he will keep you at perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him rejoice in the Lord always I say and again I say rejoice it's the will of God that we rejoice always that we pray continually and give thanks this is the will of God through Christ Jesus and just get in truth and let it reshape the way that you would think if you were listening to the father of lies and put on that righteousness who you are in him and and who he says you are in him and I'll tell you I trust I trust him with my bride and whatever he chooses with my bride I would ask you to pray for her lift her up last night after four or five days now antibiotics still running fever and still feeling awful and it's hard to watch but this physical stuff the deeper battles for us are in that spirit world gang it's in the spirit world that's where he's taking us out in the spirit world so fight that individually you each of you fight that by putting on the armor of God the belt of truth breastplate of righteousness come back next week you're going to find out about having your feet taken care of pretty cool deal um, Brett's going to bring that message next week I promise you don't want to miss it can I have you stand I want to pray for us and we're going to close in song Lord I just ask that you protect this church family as they put on this armor to become a little more protected from the evil one to begin to experience victory in the middle of this battle that's so strong because he's just a father of lies he's a deceiver he's so deceptive and yet you've conquered satan and sin and death and hell through the blood of your son jesus on the cross and our simple faith and trust in him we give you praise god we just give you praise i pray that we get to experience the church family walking in victory more and more this week as we put on that armor and we praise you for the armor god in jesus name Amen. Hey, church family, you are dismissed. The altar is open. If you'd like some time to pray, you can sing with us as well. Every breath we could ever see.